Hello and welcome back to Tinker Talks Guns. We're here today to talk about a customized Hawes Western Marshall revolver. And if you notice a certain resemblance to the Colt Single Action Army, you're right on point. In the wake of World War II, with the rise of television, the television Western became very popular and made the Colt 1873 very iconic. Now, of course, Colts, even then, were relatively expensive, so other people began to bring in knockoffs of the Colt 1873 Peacemaker. And one of the early importers of these was Hawes Firearms, who in the 50s through 70s imported a great many single-action revolvers made by J.P. Sauer and Son in Germany. And these are high quality revolvers available in calibers from 22 to 44 Magnum. And um, these guns were significantly cheaper and they looked enough like Colts for television. So a lot of the 19, late 50s, early 60s Westerns um, actually substituted Hawes Western Marshall revolvers for Colts. Now, there are some cosmetic differences. The area under the barrel, for example, is kicked out in a much more Ruger-like fashion. And, um, and there are some other differences too, and we're going to take a look at those on the tabletop. First things first, we'll unload and show clear. And this is exactly like a Colt in that respect. You bring the hammer to half cock, so that the cylinder free rotates, open the loading gate, and make sure there are no cartridges in the holes. So, we are clear. Now, this gun, as I said, has been modified, and we'll talk about that. But first thing I want to show you is a 45 Colt with the standard size 1873 frame. Yes, this gun has other modifications too, and we can talk about that in another video. What I really want to show you is the frame size. And as you can see, the Western Marshall is significantly beefier, and this is because this frame was also offered in 44 Magnum. And it will handle pretty stout 45 Colt loads, although I wouldn't go crazy on that. These are not new guns. So, while they came in the standard 4 and 5 eighths, 5 and a half, and 7 and a half inch lengths you'd expect, um, this one I wanted to be a little handier. And so I did various modifications, starting with recontouring the front of the frame so that it resembled a Colt more closely. And then I, I had a specific purpose in mind, in addition to just making a, what we now call a sheriff's model. And with what I paid for this gun, I felt no compunctions about modifying it. Um, my thought for this gun was to use it for my pooping in the woods. Oh my God, is that a bear gun? And so I did various changes to make it handier and easy to carry. And that included, as I said, mimicking the ejectorless model from Colt. And yes, a sheriff's model is something they started calling them when they reintroduced them in the late 20th century. Um, before that, Colt with great imagination and amazing marketing skill, referred to them simply as the ejectorless model, and you could order them from that way from Colt in any number of barrel lengths. So I removed the ejector rod housing and reinstalled the sight after modifying it slightly. And yes, it is set back from the front of the barrel because for some reason Colt often did that on their ejectorless models. I have no idea why. But the three and a half inch barrel suited my desire for a handier gun. And for the intended purpose, it was not necessary that I be able to reload in a great tearing hurry. Now, one thing I did do to facilitate reloading is these notches at the back of the cylinder. And this is an idea I got from a Magnum Wheel Man on the Single Action Army Forum. And what that does is it allows you to flick the cartridges out with a fingernail. 
And I have found that this works with this particular gun, even with pretty stout loads. Um, the empty brass comes out with a flick of a finger, so it's actually quite handy. Now, other guns with this feature, with other level and varying levels of quality of the chambers and the reaming and such, that may not be the case, but in this case, it works really, really well. And having lived my entire life in the Pacific Northwest, I thought it would be a really good idea to Cerakote it. And I had a friend who was just getting into the business and was dying to Cerakote something for me, so I had him do that. And as you can see, it looks very non-traditional, but it does look pretty good, and it's a tough, durable finish. You may note that there is not a great deal of holster wear on this gun or anything, or much evidence that it's been carried at all, because it hasn't. Because about the time I got this gun fully finished and got the belt, gun, holster, and everything in line that I wanted, I came across a Ruger 41541 Magnum at an attractive price, and that was better fit to the purpose. So this gun never got used for its intended purpose. Several things about it. Um, for those not familiar with single action handguns, it is not safe to carry around under the hammer because like a Colt, if you're carrying around under the hammer, the firing pin will be pressed against the primer by the hammer and any serious jolt can detonate the cartridge. Now, unlike a Colt, this has a different system. Now, a Colt has the firing pin fixed in the hammer. This one has a floating firing pin that rebounds under spring tension. And while this is a nice, durable system, it, is, it does not allow you to carry the gun safely with the hammer down. You can carry it with in this safety notch, but it's really not recommended. So the standard practice when loading a single action revolver is to load a chamber, skip a chamber, and then load four more chambers so that when you've got the last chamber loaded and you cock the hammer, it will lower the hammer on an empty chamber. <clears throat> now, taking the gun apart is exactly like an 1873 Colt. You press the button here pull out the axis pin, and you can pull the cylinder out. Not much to see here, except that it's kind of dirty because, well, I was shooting it for this video. And it is a pleasant gun to shoot. Now, one thing about this gun <laughs> is that the trigger pull is extremely light. And all I did was a tiny bit of stoning things inside and the trigger pull breaks so light that I can't measure it on the lovely Lyman trigger scale that my friend Leah bought me as a gift. Um, but several people are guessing that have tried it are guessing that it's somewhere in the vicinity of half a pound. And for anyone not extraordinarily familiar with handling these weapons, that's far too light. It is solid, it locks up properly, it doesn't slip, but effectively if you touch the trigger, the gun goes off. Now that's fine because people of my age and older who were trained on these guns, you train to press against your trigger finger against the front of the trigger guard when you cock the gun and it stays pressed against the front of the trigger guard until you're ready to fire. But I would not recommend this to anyone who is not very, very familiar and well-versed in handling these guns. Like an 1873 Colt, it's a simple gun. There's uh, not a ton of things to show you. And the internals, aside from the hammer and the floating firing pin, are very much like a Colt's. And being from J.P. Sauer and Sohn, it's, as you might expect, very well made. I did preserve the markings on the barrel. As you can see, Western Marshall 45. Anyway, 
It's a fine old gun, despite my interfering with it. And it's, well, I think, well fit for purpose, which was to defend myself against whimsical or irascible, irascible large animals when I'm buggering around in the forest. It's just I came up with something better. But I like it quite a lot. I do shoot it now and again. Oh, and addressing the defense against dangerous animals, I typically loaded this with a 270 grain hard cast Keith bullet on top of enough powder to drive it from this gun at around 900 feet per second, which, uh, as you can see in the shooting video, imparts a pretty good wallop. One thing I would like to note, this modification with the scallop at the back of the cylinder, the chamber, you should not fire old style balloon head cartridges. Well, this gun is now entirely restricted to modern cartridges because the balloon head cartridges could blow out through that gap, especially if they're loaded to their original spec, which was a 250 grain bullet over 40 grains of black powder which in a balloon head case would drive the bullet out of a five and a half inch barrel at 950 feet per second. So it's a pretty stout load. In fact, when the government used the 1873, they came up with a compromise cartridge called 45 government, which was the length of a 45 Schofield with the rim of a 45 Colt, because that was much easier for the soldiers to handle and train with. Now, the Hawes Western Marshals are, they sold a lot of these. They're fairly readily available. And they're not very expensive. Now this one, six years ago, five years ago, six years ago, I paid $175 for it. And it came with a 45 ACP cylinder, along with the uh, 45 Colt cylinder for that price. And that was quite the bargain. However, the prices have gone up because the collector's market has discovered them and um, I think you'll pay easily twice what I paid for mine now. All guns have gone up in price, but particularly ones that can be somehow assigned some form of collector's value. Um, this gun, um, <laughs> I, I have no inclination to part with it. It um, represents one of my earlier efforts at gunsmithing. And uh, I'm quite happy with the way it came out and the way it shoots. And even though I have no earthly use for it, I actually, uh, I really like it. And I think if you get your own Hawes Western Marshall, you will find that you've gotten a solid, good quality, single action revolver of the old school. And uh, that's, that's not always a bad thing. So, if you like the video, please hit like and subscribe. It's the only way Facebook notices me and spreads the good news. And if you want to support me, my efforts here in a more material fashion, there's a link to Patreon in the description. I hope this finds you well, stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you again real soon.